Amen, amen. You may be seated. And turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament. First of all, to the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 4, and then we'll be looking at Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25. We are reading today from the New King James Version, and our entire scripture lesson text can be found on the insert in your bulletin and on page 650 and 676 of your pew Bible. Romans, chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Pray with me this morning as we examine this text with this thought in mind. Walking with the Spirit. Walking with the Spirit. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity of standing before these thy people. Lord, we pray now that the words of my mouth and that the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let the redeemer of the Lord say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Christian baptism is a symbol of our faith in Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, we identify with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rose from the grave to demonstrate for us the fact that our walk with God does not end when this life ends. And the resurrection also demonstrates that our walk with God after we receive Christ should be different than our walk was before Christ came into our life. Paul explains that the resurrection offers us a new way to walk and a new path along which to walk. But we need to take the hand of God in order to walk in this new and meaningful way. We need God's hand. We can't do it alone. Too often, Christians walk as though they are still living unredeemed lives. They allow their old nature to lead them down the same old path that they used to walk. And it's so easy for your old nature to take you that way because that's so familiar. But to take hold of the new, we have to be willing to let go of the old. We've been given a new path to walk, but we don't know this road. We haven't been this way before. That's why we need a guy. And that's why God has given us his spirit to guide us along this uncharted territory. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in all the vital areas of our life. But this life is so broad, where do we start? Where do we need the, the most help? Well, the answer is in the text. So let's turn to the text to discover where we need to seek God's help in order to walk in a brand new way. Look at the text again, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 25. It says, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then verse 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our speech to guide our speech. The first area that we need the Spirit's guidance is, is with our words. Lying is a habit of the old nature. 
And lying instantly disconnects you from God. God is truth, and when you lie, you're automatically disconnected from God because God cannot lie. So your fellowship with God is broken when you tell a lie. Now that doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but your communication with God is broken because you stepped out of range. In fact, Jesus tells us that Satan is the father of lies. So when you lie, not only do you disconnect yourself from God, but you connect automatically, you hook up with the purpose of Satan, whether you know it or not. You may not be aware that you're doing the devil's work, you're just trying to get yourself out of a tough situation. But realize that every lie immediately gets you into a worse situation. You may not realize that you stepped away from God and lined up with the devil until you look for God to back you up and God's not there. And you say, where are you, Lord? And God says, I'm over here in truth where I've always been. You moved away from me. Walk with my spirit and you get the power that you're seeking. See, God will not empower our lying. God will not empower our sinfulness. So when we walk away from God, we walk away from God's power. Lying is sin, and God does not empower sin. The scripture says, put away lying. Speak truth. And the truth will set you free. That's, those are the words of Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the truth may get you in trouble, but it will also set you free. How can it do both? Well, simple. The truth will make the devil angry, and that will send trouble your way. But when you walk with God in truth, God has your back, and that will set you free. God has your back, so God will set you free as long as you stay in the power of his truth. God fights your battle. God sets you free. So no matter how much trouble comes your way as a result of telling the truth, that's God's way. So that's the safe way. Lying is what puts you in danger. So we need the Holy Spirit to guide our speech so that we can put away lying. Put away lying. And there's greater help that we need from the Spirit as regard to our speech. Verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now edification means instruction or encouragement. So if your words are not helpful to anyone, keep them to yourself. Our speech has become so corrupted today that no one is offended anymore by being blasted by vile and degrading and hateful language. And that happens when you're just sitting on your porch, people drive by in their cars, or every time you turn on the, any entertainment media, on TV and uh, your computer, everything, you're being blasted with vile and degrading language. And we have accepted that as being normal. And that's the real offense, that no offense is taken by this stuff anymore, which is patently offensive. Our society and our, and our whole culture have been bombarded by vile language. Now, rap has been around for quite a while now, and just like the sagging pants that showed up at the same time that rap did, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The pants are sagging lower and the rap lyrics are getting lower. And rap is even slipping into the church. I had a youth pastor explain to me once that there is a difference between rap as a lyrical style and hip hop as a music genre. And I can appreciate that difference. I understand that difference. You know, it's not the genre that the, is the issue. That's not my issue. I'm not talking about the style or the genre or the type of music. I'm talking about the content. I'm talking about the content of what you're saying. What comes out of your mouth is the indication of what's in your heart. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. Jesus said that the mouth speaks from the overabundance of the heart. Look at what he said in, in Matthew 12, 34. He was talking to a group of Pharisees. He said, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. My issue is that I cannot entertain myself with anything in a crowd of people or in my car, in my earphones, that I cannot listen to in the presence of God. So if you would not play this music or this entertainment directly into God's ear, then you should not pump it into your own. And please don't pump it into my ears. I try to keep a direct communication in my heart with God, and I can't afford to let you contaminate it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So out of your mouth comes vile and disgusting and hateful words. If that's what happened, then I know that your heart is not a home for the God of all peace. It cannot be. 
Don't let the devil fool you. The devil has put forth from the very beginning that sin is okay with God. But the devil is a liar. Therefore, the Bible says, put away lying and speak truth one with another. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our speech. Now, our speech is important to God. Our words are guided by what's in our heart. But it's not just our words that can cause grief to the Holy Spirit. Our deeds can grieve the Spirit also. Look at what the, the scripture says, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our actions. To guide our actions. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us away from emotion that will cause us to act in disobedience to God. Now, it's not a sin to get angry. It's a sin to stay angry. Think about that for a minute. That's what the scripture said. It's a sin to allow anger to take you away from your walk with God. Be angry, but sin not. That suggests that the natural emotion of being angry at the actions or at the words of others is not a sin in itself. But what you do with your anger determines how it affects your relationship with God. What you do with that anger determines your relationship and your walk with God. Listen to what James says. He explains how our, our emotions and, and how we yield to our emotions can lead us into sin if we let them. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We are tempted when we have an emotion, whether anger or lust or envy or greed, and we allow that emotion and that feeling to prompt us to conceive evil, to conceive evil. In the conception of evil, sin is born. In the plot, in the plan, in the ownership of an evil purpose, sin is born. David, back in the Old Testament, had not sinned when he looked at another man's wife as she bathed on the top of her roof. That, that wasn't sin, even though it sounded like it might have been. He sinned when he plotted how to get that woman into his house. When he conceived that plot, that's when he was sinning. If he had just looked at it and looked away, he would not have sinned. Now, any emotion can take us into sin if we let it, but it seems like none quicker than anger. Listen again to what James says about the wrath of the anger of man. James chapter 1, verse 19 says, So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, think about it. We got that just about backwards. We, 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 we don't want to hear much, and we quit the anger. James said, the Bible says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. No matter how much righteous indignation you feel you have, that doesn't carry out God's righteous plan. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So don't let anger motivate action that will disrupt your walk with God. Now, I have not had any training in psychology, so I can't discuss with you the details of repressed anger when you just hold anger in. I can't tell you about what that will do psychologically. But I have had trained as an engineer, so I can tell you when you plug a pressure leak in one spot, the pressure will blow a gas to somewhere else if you don't find a way to get rid of it. So what can you do with your anger so that you can continue your walk with God? Well, listen to what the book of Romans says. Romans 12, 19. Paul writes, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. What do we do with our anger? We give it to the Lord. We give it to God. It has to go somewhere, and since God has assured us that he'll take care of vengeance, we need to take him at his word and hand our anger over to the Lord as soon as it starts to build up in us. Don't let it stay and corrode your spirit. Give it to the vengeance master. Jesus, the Lord says, I'm the, the master of getting vengeance. I know how to do it better than you do. So when anger grabs you by surprise, Get on your hotline to the Lord and say, Lord, take the anger away from me and give me your peace. Take it away from me, Lord, and give me your peace. And if you make a habit of doing that, if you make that your habit, you'll find your peace will be multiplied tenfold. If you 
Instantly learn how to turn it over to the Lord, not hold on to it, not let it build, not push it aside, not pack it down, but turn it loose to the Lord. Say, Lord, you take care of it. It's in your hands. Your peace will be increased. The other thing you should know is that if you don't turn your anger over to the Lord, you end up turning it over to the devil. Yes, you will. You may not mean to, but that's what will happen. The devil is waiting for that angry moment for you to step away from God so that he can plant a seed of destruction in your life. So many lives have been destroyed by one, one angry moment. One angry moment when you step away from God and the devil is able to use you for his purposes. When people determine to seek their own vision, the devil has a field day as each one tries to repay the other. You do something to get back somewhere else, they do something to get back with you, and it never ends because the devil won't let it end. The devil expects you to react according to your old nature, and your old nature is going to tell you to get revenge. But God has granted us the opportunity to walk in a brand new way. To walk God's way, we need to follow the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our actions. We shouldn't let our emotions take us into actions that will displease God. Our words and our deeds are important for a godly walk and a godly lifestyle, but God is also concerned with another portion of our character. Look at verse 28. It says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who, to him who has need. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our motives, to guide our motives. Walking in newness means adopting a whole new set of moral values. A thief is not concerned with the needs of the person from whom he is stealing. He's not, he doesn't care at all about that person's needs. His motives are entirely selfish. I want something, therefore I need what you have. So rather than taking from someone else with, with, uh, with no regard for their needs, a person who is walking with the Spirit will be moved to give that which he has earned to help another person out. Paul says, work with your hands to give to others. That takes a new motivation. That kind of motivation requires not only a change of action, but a change of attitude. To walk in the news of life, we need to allow God to change that which motivates us to do what we do. The old nature is concerned only about self. And you cannot persuade your old nature to be concerned about anyone other than self. It won't happen no matter how hard you try. A lot of people live in frustration trying to convince their old nature to be a better person. And no amount of logic or argument is going to change your old nature. Your old nature will not listen to logic or reason. That's why God gave you a new nature. Because your old nature is corrupt and unredeemable. And people who are still motivated by their old nature will never listen to reason no matter how much you argue with them. So stop arguing with them. Tell them about the God who guides your steps and then let your walk match your talk. That's the best thing you can do. Tell them about the God who is leading your life and then walk a life to show that you're following God. That's your best testimony. That's what we've been called to do. The Spirit of God empowers us to walk in the newness of life. To walk in the newness of life, we need to allow God to change that which motivates us to do what we do. Because otherwise we do the right thing for the wrong reason, we'll miss out on our blessing. Until we learn to listen to God, our actions won't change much, and our motives won't change at all. And neither will our walk. For our motivation to change, we need to follow God's guidance. But we also need guidance in one more very vital area of our lives. Look at the text once again in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even in, as God in Christ forgave you. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our relationships. To guide our relationships. Christ saved us so that we could walk in the newness of life. And with salvation, Christ also gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could rise above the shortcomings of our old nature. We grieve the Lord when we allow that old nature to destroy the relationship that the Lord has sown in our lives. And that's how relationships are destroyed. When the broken parts of our nature come together, each one of us, we have discord and conflict. Our brokenness and the brokenness of those that we interact with come together, and those broken parts 
make that conflict and that destruction and that hatred and all the other things that come with it. That's our relationship about destroy when the broken parts. But the Spirit of God is ready and able to rise us above our faults so that we can get along with one another. But we must listen to the Spirit. It won't help us if we don't listen to Him. We grieve the Spirit when we push Him aside and do things our way. We grieve the Spirit when we ignore His voice and follow our emotions and the leading of the devil. We grieve the Spirit when we avoid His control because we know that He's going to rebuke the actions that we want to take. When we turn our face from God because we don't want Him to tell Him no, we try to constrain his power over our lives, but that doesn't work. God knows that we're headed for trouble when we turn from him, and that grieves him. That grieves the spirit. When we walk away from him, the, the Holy Spirit is not going to grab you and tackle you. He's going to let you walk away, but he's grieved that you're walking down that dark path. For example, one of my children, he's not going to be named, had a habit of watching the eyes of my wife and me when, when he wanted to ask for something. And what he would do, he would look us in the eye and ask. And if he saw no coming in our eyes, he changed and asked the other parent mid-sentence. He'd say, can I go outside looking straight in my eyes? Mama. <laughs> and I'd say, I'm not your mama. And the answer still no. <laughs> and so he, he, he kept trying. That didn't work for him, but he kept trying. And that doesn't work with God either. You can't avoid God to keep from hearing him tell you to stop doing what you know you should not be doing. That doesn't work. Listen to what... David said about that. Avoiding God does not work because God sees everything and sees all and knows your heart. Psalm 139 verse 7 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. There's nowhere we can get away from God's influence. So we can't just turn our back and think God can't see us because we turned away from him. We have to be honest with God. We can't hold on to our old walk and walk with God. You can't do both. Look at the text once again. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We have to, have to allow the Holy Spirit to work on our relationships. Usually we want God to work on somebody else. Lord, work on this person. But what God usually wants to start with is to work on us. He wants to fix us. And so if God does that and fix us, then we can handle the other folks. If you look carefully at what Paul is trying to tell us, we have good reason to listen to God for changing our ways. Listen to what he said. He said, be kind because God, for Christ's sake, has been kind to you. Be loving because God, for Christ's sake, has been loving to you. Be forgiving because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. God is calling us to walk in the newness of life. So we need to listen to God's Holy Spirit as he takes us along this path. To walk in the newness of life, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide our relationships. And so now we return to the question with which we started. Where do we need the Holy Spirit's guidance? We need the Spirit of God to guide us in all the vital areas of our life. We need him to guide our speech so that we won't say the wrong things. We need him to guide our actions so that we won't do the wrong things. We need him to guide our morals so that we won't do the right things for the wrong reasons and lose our blessing. We need the Spirit of God to guide us in our relationships as we attempt to get along with each other as children of God. And we cannot do it without him. It's impossible without God. Sometimes it seems impossible to get along with folks, even with the Spirit's help. But it's impossible without God. To walk in the newness of life, we must walk with the Spirit of God in obedience and faith. If you're being obedient to the, to the Spirit of God, he's going to take care of all these other people and situations. And you have to walk with faith that, you, that God will do that, that God's going to straighten it out. You just walk in obedience, let him work about straightening it out. The moment we decide that we don't need the Spirit's guidance, we're going down a dark path, a dark path. And nothing will get better for us until we come back to the light. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that his disciples, that includes all of us, could continue to walk with him after he returned to heaven. And I'm glad that I came back to the light and began my walk with Jesus. Jesus went to the cross so that I could walk in the newness of life. So I'm going to walk with Jesus for a little while. 
Jesus let them put nails in his hands and his feet so that I could walk in the newness of life. So I'm going to walk with Jesus for a little while. Jesus let them spear him in his side so that I could walk in the newness of life. So I'm going to walk with Jesus for a while. Jesus let them put him in a borrowed grave for three days and three nights so that I could walk in the newness of life. So I'm going to walk with Jesus for a little while. Jesus rose up from that grave one Sunday morning declaring that all power in heaven and earth was in his hand so that you and I could walk in the newness of life. Don't you want to walk with Jesus for a little while? The best thing you can do in this life is hook up with Jesus and walk with his spirit. I'm going to walk with the Lord's Spirit for the rest of my days. What about you? What about you? Shall we stand as the choir comes to sing for us?